to our webinar series from X-Rite Pantone. We're very happy that you could make it. Uh, in this year, 2012, there's going to be a lot of talk about new measurement standards. And this webinar is designed to cut through the clutter and provide some clarity on what can be a confusing topic. We're pleased to have with us Ray Shadler to present this information to us. Ray is the Global OEM Technical Manager for X-Rite and is uniquely qualified to present us this information. So Ray, welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Jim. Um, as Jim said, I, I work with our OEM customers, but I've really worked in the, the graphic arts and photographic industry for uh, 15 years with X-Rite and most of my adult life, which uh, those of you who know me and know my gray hair may have an idea of how long that's been. Um, but in addition to those OEM customers, um, I also represent X-Rite with uh, various industry associations and standards associations. And so I'm hoping that as uh, we go through this presentation, I don't uh, suddenly drop into standards language, which is a unique dialect. And uh, if I do, you know, we can try and rein me back in and correct it later. But uh, let's start off and with the first piece, which is really to uh, look at what the difference is between standards and specifications. In uh, casual conversation in the printing world, we often talk about standards and specifications as if they were the same thing. Uh, but in general, standards are set either at the international level, which is the ISO, or set at the national level. And then industry specifications generally follow the standards. And they may be regional, or they may be you know, more widespread than that. But there is an, uh, a piece here to remember, which is the standards have uh, one role, and specifications then essentially focus those standards into a very industry-specific use. So today we're really going to talk about ISO standards primarily. And uh, the big one we're going to talk about here is ISO 13655, Spectral Measurement and Color Metric Computation for Graphic Arts Industries. Uh, big mouthful, but the, what we're really going to take away from this, this is the, the uh, standard that defines how we measure color. And in this particular edition, it introduces something called the M factor, or different color measurement modes to uh, read. So this is a, a big piece of this discussion. And from 13655, these other standards uh, also pick up some, some pieces dealing with um, these new illumination ideas. And all of this comes back really from uh, the issues of OBAs, or optical brightening agents. Uh, we've had an increasing amount of optical brightening agents put in papers over the last few years. And this is one of the reasons that 13655 uh, introduced these new M factors. But I may be getting a little bit ahead of my story here. Um, let's first then see what was the problem that was trying to be solved. So I'm going to build a series of slides here. Um, and you may or may not be able to see this well over WebEx, but I'll also talk through them as well. So probably the most common viewing condition that people look at our end product in is uh, tungsten, or, or the house lighting that we normally have, though that's slowly transitioning into uh, some other lighting sources as well. And while this is in a controlled viewing booth, and hopefully your viewing booth doesn't look like this filled with colorful products, but we'll see as we move through some other lights as well that uh, how both the paper in front, which is really four different sheets of paper, uh, looks and then how the overall image looks as well. So the next image here is uh, a store lighting. So we can see that it's a warmer uh, sort of natured light. And it also, though, doesn't have a lot of, where you can see that it's not changing the color of the different papers relative to each other very much. And that's just like the tungsten light, because there's very little UV content in there. And it's the UV content that really um, makes the OBAs come into play. So then the next light we have here is daylight. So daylight is our official um, normal standardized viewing condition for graphic art. So, and then um, and we use that because that's sort of a nice generic broad bland source. And it has much more UV content in it. So you can start to pick up in this illustration the fact that the, uh, some of the papers now are starting to see some distinguishing from each other. 
And if we uh, take that to the extreme and turn on just a UV source, now we can see that there's a big change in the papers. Um, the one on the right obviously has much more uh, OBA content in it and thus looks brighter. And in fact, in, in real life, uh, it looks brighter as well. And we can also see in the uh, in the pieces behind there, there are a few uh, objects in there that must have some sort of fluorescent uh, uh, dyes or colorants in them as well because they're picking up from that UV. So uh, to minimize some of this effect, I've uh, done another image here where I tried to take the color piece out of the question here. So I neutralized all of these images to the gray surround and back so that there should be less um, just overall color balance question. But even then, we can still see um, what's holding true is that as we get more UV in the light source, we're seeing more effective optical brighteners. And we're also seeing the effect of the, the uh, both the UV content and just the color of the light on the surrounding objects as well. So remembering that OBAs work through fluorescence and they're absorbing energy down in the range that we can't see, that UV range, and then re-emitting it out into uh, range that we can see. And so this effect, this OBA effect, um, is a good thing because it makes papers look whiter and brighter under some light sources, um, but then there's a problem as well. So in practice, OBA enhanced paper can be really challenging to color manage. Um, so, you know, we've solved one problem by making uh, papers look brighter, at least in some light sources, but it also changes the way instruments see. So just as I see those papers differently, instruments see those papers differently too, depending on the amount of OBA content in there and depending on the light source in the instrument as well. So uh, one of the things to remember here is that when we're talking about the different light sources or illuminants in the instrument, we're not talking about the settings used for colorimetric calculations which are the illuminant and observer, like the D50 two degree observer, which is common in the graphic arts. Um, but we're here talking about the actual uh, light source in the instrument that's used to you know, illuminate the paper and measure from. So this is a little bit different. And that's really what the M standards are all about. This new standard, um, well, it's not a new standard. It's the new edition of 13655, uh, defines some much more uh, standardized illuminants inside of the devices. And it also tries to cover both historical conditions as well as make some room for the future. So why is this, uh, why was this done, right? So back in the previous years, papers didn't have a lot of optical brighteners. And so when the papers have little or no optical brighteners, it didn't really matter what you illuminated with. So we're looking at here a spectral curve. And we can see whether I measure it with M0, which is a tungsten source, or a daylight source, or even cut all the UV out, we essentially get the same curve, same look, measurement look to the paper. But if I take a paper and add a lot of brighteners to it, suddenly the story changes, right? So now uh, we have a paper with a lot of optical brighteners. And, and so if we cut the UV, we still have that nice flat curve that we had before. But then depending on the amount of uh, UV excitement in the illuminant, then the, the look of the paper changes. So we have two different curves going on here uh, based on how much UV content is in those bulbs. So this is um, also reflects the same thing we saw with our eyes in those viewing booth pictures before. As we change the amount of UV, the instrument sees it differently and our eyes see it differently as well. So the question is, well, how did we get here, right? So as I sort of said before, OBAs weren't really directly addressed in previous standards because it wasn't much of an issue. The papers that we used and the ones that were specified in the standards had uh, no or very little OBA. And then uh, so the next question is, of course, well, D50 was the stated standard. How, one, how come no one followed this? And uh, part of it is a historical piece from uh, measurement is that the density standard said you should use luminant A. So the two measurement standards were in conflict with each other. But it's also um, really a history from a technology side as well, right? Not only did instrument manufacturers know how to control luminant A very well, but it also allowed the introduction of portable instruments that could be battery operated. So that was uh, a function that really worked well with 
uh, alumina A or tungsten bulbs, and there was no real equivalent D50 source to do the same thing. So in the absence of OBAs, you know, that was a very good solution and still works very well today for uh, many situations, but it sort of at least gives us an idea how we got to that path. But the future then says we need to have some more flexibility. So how many measurement modes are there? ISO 13655 defines four different measurement conditions or illuminant conditions. And one of the things to remember is each one not only has a unique definition, but it has unique requirements and it has a best application suggestion from ISO. So we're going to walk through each one of these. M0. So you know, some people have tried to give it some other uh, ways of talking about it, but M0 is really the baseline piece. Uh, it's the broad umbrella to cover essentially all instruments that have been made that we don't know too much about as well as has a should condition that says, and this should mean that they are Illumina A. So, you know, this is one of the challenges when they came up with this new standard was how do we have a broad umbrella, some way to communicate uh, what we measured with when we don't know much about the instrument, and but we also want to have something that tells us about how instruments were used for a long time, which is, of course, Illumina A. So, um, the piece to remember here is that if you have M0 as your illuminant condition and you have a manufacturer like x ray or Great Technic Beth that had a long history of creating incandescent based devices that held that tight tolerance, it really expands the ability to use M0 beyond the best practices case that are called out in uh, 13655 because 13655 views M0 as a very broad umbrella. So because of that, then, you know, these instruments have been used to manage color worldwide and still are today. Um, but because the M0 specification doesn't define the UV content, ISO then says that uh, M0 isn't recommended for measuring substrates exhibiting fluorescence, right? So uh, this is sort of an interesting counterpoint because from a practical standpoint, most of us, most of us have been using M0 instruments for this purpose for years. You know, it's been working very well, um, but we need to make sure that when we do that, that uh, we're using an M0 that is well controlled. So, you know, as I said before, um, if the instrument manufacturer, like X-ray, has maintained tight tolerances to Illumina A, the M0 is still a, a practical workflow. If you're measuring papers with OBAs or fluorescent inks, you know, this is ISO language now. If you're measuring papers with OBAs or fluorescent inks, instruments meeting M1 are not available, then you need to communicate value, and you need to communicate values. You want to use instruments of a like manufacturer and that they're, you know, same model and tested to make sure they work. And really, this is a key piece throughout this whole presentation is um, you need to define what you're using and tell people all of the pieces that you're using when you're exchanging data. If you're doing everything internally in your own closed world, that's probably not as important. But when you're exchanging data or trying to match data from a standard or a specification, it's very important that you make sure that you follow the pieces that are in there as well. So after M0, of course, what follows naturally is M1. M1 is really a two-part condition because there are two ways of getting um, to a practical use of M1. So M1, uh, part one, says that the light used to measure a sample should match illuminant D50 or a daylight illuminant. And um, this is really the traditional language that was used in uh, 13655, but now they've put some additional kind of uh, wording around this. Um, but again, M1 was designed to try and uh, tell us not only the illuminant, but that illuminant also defines the UV content. So this standard was then defined to you know, figure out how to reduce the variations in measurement due to fluorescence. And M1 Part 1 is designed to address both optical breaking agents and fluorescence from other sources like inks or other colorants. M1 Part 2 
is a little less stringent, right? So it defines a way just to measure OBA enhanced papers that doesn't cover the fluorescing inks. Um, and it defines a compensation method to uh, do a UV for the UV area. So for the UV component, it allows for a compensation process to do this. And then just requires continuous illumination from 400 to 700. So while a little less strict, this gives us uh, more flexibility in designing instrumentation and um, and then narrows the use case down to uh, just for OBAs. So one of the things that you have to remember then is because this has uh, a less strict piece, just like M0, you really should probably be testing carefully for compliance. Is your viewing booth really meeting the standard for D50? Um, does this conform to ISO 3664? You know, are, are your observations, what you see with your eyes in the booth with an OBA Brighton paper also meeting the same kind of results you get from measurement data? Then we have M2. M2 specifies for the first time what UV exclusion means, right? So it says how much, you know, UV do we cut inside of a measuring instrument? So uh, part of the piece here is we look at that ISO language and it says UV exclusion, but uh, in the real world we talk about UV cut or no UV or UV filtered. And so there's a lot of different kind of language that goes on. But one of the big pieces here is while we've used uh, UV cut instruments for years, often for process control, there really was no standard that defined exactly how UV should be cut. And so this is one thing that 13655 gives us, is it now defines an exact way to meet this condition. You know, some had a sharp cutoff, some had a slope cutting off, but now it's defined precisely. And probably a nice uh, benefit to that is it also provides a test. So that test is a, something that a manufacturer can use, but it's also a pretty simple test um, that even a user can use to make sure that their instruments are meeting uh, the right condition for M2. And as part of our XRG efforts, XRGA efforts, um, all the new UV cut X-ray products meet this definition. So, you know, why would you measure with M2? Right. One reason is to uh, measure OBA enhanced papers and take away the effect of the OBAs. Uh, this is often used in some process control and calibration processes. Um, you know, this is a way to just make sure that no matter how much OBA is in there, you're measuring just the colorant and you're not measuring the paper. Then after M2 comes M3. So this is a polarization uh, definition, which is, again, something that was never really defined uh, for color measurement uh, in an ISO standard before. And it does two pieces here. It actually says um, we're going to take that polarization factor, which reduces that uh, first surface reflection, and we're also going to add to that definition the uh, UV cut properties of M2. And this is, of course, a good thing because polarizers always cut UV, but they could cut different amounts of UV. So now the, the definition of M3 defines not only polarization, but also puts limits and uh, an actual test again on how much UV is excluded by that polarization filter. So as I said before, ISO then has some recommendations. And uh, I'll, I'll explain their recommendations, but I'll also explain, I think, some practical use cases as well. So uh, from the ISO recommendations, it says M1, either part one or part two, can be used to measure the effect of OBAs. Uh, traditionally, we've also used M0 for this case. And this is, again, a case where M0 is a, is a reasonable workflow um, as long as you're using uh, tungsten illumination that's well controlled. Uh, um, and then for measuring ink fluorescence, uh, ISO is a little more strict. It's saying M1 part one is the only uh, really best practice to go do this. And again says that um, M0 is a practical alternative as long as it's well controlled. Then um, if we're not worried about OBA, so really you know, we go back to where we've been in the past where the stock had no OBAs at all, then M0, M1, M1 Part 2, or M2 will all yield equivalent results. And if we remember that spectral curve from before, that's exactly what we saw there. And then if we want to cut out the effect of OBAs, so we have a brightened paper, and we want to take away the effect of those brighteners, then either M2 or M3, where we also need that polarization factor, will work. And then 
Uh, the last is if we want to cut those first surface reflections, there's really only one choice, and that's M3. And that's for those special use cases where cutting that uh, first surface reflection really yields color data that's more like what our eye is seeing as well. Now, I've added a last line here, which is inherent through essentially all ISO standards and is really important uh, for this piece as well, which is says, before exchanging data, you need to agree on what M standard to use. Uh, because you're, if you're doing this, this is, again, just making sure that you're all working on the same page and that uh, you do this. So there's another solution as well. And that other solution is uh, a proprietary product from x which is called OBC. And OBC is an optical breaking compensation process that's available only in our profiling product, I1 Profiler. And it allows uh, correction for any viewing illuminant, so not just a standardized viewing illuminant, and any brightened paper. So it really ties a very uh, tightly the, the final viewing environment and the paper you're using along with the colorant you're using and creates an ICC profile that will allow the closest match for a defined workflow. So it's, it's a little bit different than the uh, measurement conditions, but for some workflows it yields uh, uh, really the best color match for that very defined viewing condition. In any case, the big takeaway here is agreement, right? So no matter what language and uh, how well I've interpreted agreement in different languages here, uh, the big piece here is you need to agree on all of your measurement settings uh, before starting to capture data. And then you can define these different options uh, to enable the agreement and to really get better data than you've had a chance to before. So uh, the bare minimum uh, for agreement includes uh, you know, density status, uh, either the use of an OBC profile or what M illuminant condition, so M0, M1, M2, or M3 are using. And then lastly, the color, color metric computation method. So again, this is not the illuminant condition, but this is the settings that you're using to convert the spectral data to uh, LAB or XYZ. So this is something that you need to choose pretty much before you start measuring because at least um, the illuminant condition or OBC profile are something that you can't change later even if you have the spectral data. So now that we've got a sort of basic background of what these M standards are, when will they be adopted? So um, this is one of those things where standards sometimes lead and standards sometimes follow. Um, but in this case, the standard really is trying to do a little bit of each. It's trying to allow the use of historical practices and also provide some options uh, for the future and do a better job of defining workflows that have been in use but haven't been defined at all. Um, what we can say right now is that all industry standard print conditions or industry specification print uh, implementations have all been established with M0 instrumentation. So uh, even though the standard may have different best use cases, M0 is really a de facto standard in use today. What we are seeing, though, is that the use of OBA brighten substrates is on the rise. New imaging colorants are coming out every day, and all of these are looking to give us more attention around uh, the potential use of other M standards over time. So some of these standards, um, 12647 is in uh, review now, some of, some of the pieces of it, it's an eight-part standard, and each one of those pieces is looking at whether uh, M0 or M1 is appropriate for those workflows. Then we have some new uh, standards that are in uh, draft stage right now. There's uh, 15339, which is printing from digital data across multiple technologies. And it's looking at that same question about whether M1 or M0 or some combination of those is the best workflow. And basically, uh, we have 15331, which is a, a digital printing standard. And so all of these are looking at this and saying, hmm, well, we first know that we need to define what the measurement condition is when we're exchanging data, but also trying to dis determine whether they should be calling out a particular uh, M condition or not, or just asking for the, that to be communicated. So um, just as a recap then, ISO 13655 defined new M standards. Uh, these are M0, which is a broad umbrella, but 
really from a, a normal use case in the graphic arts, it means tungsten illumination. And then we have M1 Part 1, which is a full D50 daylight match. And M1 Part 2, which simulates the D50 UV content. And then M2, which cuts the UV energy from the source completely. And then M3, which adds a definition of polarization and uh, maintains the M2 UV cut condition. And then on top of that, the ISO 5 series was redone, and now it's aligned for the graphic arts with the new M definitions. So you can use any of these M definitions when you're measuring in density as well. So you can use your density uh, measurements simultaneously with your color measurements. And again, you just need to uh, call out what M condition you're using with your density measurements. And then ISO 3664, which is the viewing standard, has also come out with a new D50 illumination uh, definition, which essentially increases the amount of UV um, in the daylight viewing booth. And this is to better uh, make sure that the differences between brightened papers and unbrightened stock are easier to determine, and also to make sure that this is standardized so that we don't have uh, bulbs that have uh, differing amounts of UV content out there. So as always, you know, exchanging data uh, is important. And actually, it's been working with ISO to come up with a, a better way to exchange data. And uh, that's based on our color exchange format language. There's four standards in, uh, currently in process in ISO. They're all under the 17972 banner. The first is just uh, putting the ISO stamp on the standard CXF data exchange. But then um, parts two and three add both our, uh, an expansion of some existing ISO standards for target definition, as well as uh, providing some new uh, language on how to actually define the layout of a target using CXF. And then lastly is, CX, is CXF-4, which is about spot color exchange, so ways to actually uh, define spot color uh, measurements in a way that allows more useful data across with those measurements in, in addition. So um, that's ISO work that is coming up, and you'll start to see that come out in uh, various applications. And then uh, another piece of uh, standardization, in this case an X-Rite standardization, that will um, be useful to know about, which is XRGA. So this uh, ties directly into 13655. So we're uh, under that banner of XRGA. We've taken any changes that 13655 has called out, and uh, we've brought those into our instruments. And uh, it also does some additional pieces as well. It uh, helps you know, keep our nice inner model agreement for existing instruments, and it brings those tighter together. And it also provides a single standard for all of the future uh, X-ray graphic arts instruments. And then it provides a single point of traceability. So the single point of traceability is to uh, NIST. And so the combination of all of these means that we get uh, instruments that uh, have a tighter agreement to each other, different types of instruments that have tighter agreement, tighter agreement to 13655, and a simple traceability path. So all graphic arts instruments from XRIT ship in compliance with XRGA, and we're transitioning our imaging instruments that same way. And uh, existing measurement, measurement instruments that are uh, shipped in for their annual recertification will be uh, XRGA compliant as soon as the return. So this is a way to take your existing population of instruments and uh, really gain that benefit of XRGA and uh, 13655 compliance as well. I think that's it, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ray. That was an excellent presentation. And thank you for attending this webinar.